Hey there, my fellow cult reachers and anti-religionists. This is Jason from People of the Free Gift. And today I wanted to talk about a group of churches that you may or may not have heard of. They're called the Great Commission Churches. Uh, this came to my attention. A student in my class that I teach at Bethel Seminary, Understanding the Cults, uh, she was formerly a part of this group and she started uh, getting my interest, uh, curiosity, towards it. And so I did a little bit more investigation and I found that uh, all the qualifications and characteristics of a cult that we have several other videos about um, that you can check out, they definitely fit into. So I just wanted to give you kind of the background, the story behind them. Um, and this is also going to be contained in my book that's coming out soon, Sharing Jesus with the Colts. And so the Great Commission Association of Churches, GCAC, formerly Great Commission International, is an association of Christian churches in the United States, Canada, Latin America, and Asia. Most of these churches are less than 20 years old and originated with a group of Christians at Southern Colorado University who set out to preach the gospel and to fulfill the Great Commission. So the idea was... Um, and Jim McCotter is the big name behind this group and the origins anyway. Uh, they, he had this idea as he was reading the book of Acts and the Great Commission that this is something that Jesus expected to happen within a generation. And he thought that was a realistic thing. And you could see where that would come from exponentially wise if every Christian spent their time and their focus was on fulfilling the Great Commission. You would see Christians discipling Christians who would disciple Christians, and it would exponentially just happen. Um, and you kind of wonder and take note of like, okay, 20 centuries later, why haven't we? Anyway, um, so this uh, resulted in different college ministries that became churches, that became, you know, movements and different things. And uh, Jim McCotter, 1965, he's 20 years old, starts this movement around Greeley, Colorado, and he's looking at the New Testament church, trying is another one of those restoration movement type of philosophies. If we see it in the New Testament, we want to do it. If we don't, and then we don't, kind of thing. And uh, his family's religious background was with the Plymouth Brethren. And he, he stated that his desire to form the movement stemmed from his belief that God had shown him in the Bible's book of Acts a strategy, instructing Christians on how God wanted to use the church planning to reach the world for Christ within one generation. It became known as the heavenly vision. So now you got this a vision, revelation language going on here. And it was the cornerstone of the early movement. And uh, he believed that every Christian should emulate the Apostle Paul. And that Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 was basically saying that. Uh, that was the model. Um, and so early members believed that they were returning to the lost lifestyle of the first century Christians. And this lifestyle included a devotion to discipleship, which has been criticized and compared to the shepherding movement. And the shepherding movement influenced a lot of the groups that other groups that we've talked about, like International Church of Christ, um, things of that nature. So heavy discipleship. Everyone has a shepherd. Everyone's shepherding somebody else below them. And it, it gets into the minute details of your life and uh, what you can't make a decision without your shepherd's approval kind of thing. So that was, that was true of this movement as well. And so the Blitz movement uh, started in 1970. Uh, Jim McCotter, Dennis Clark, Herschel Martindale, others um, approximately 30 college-age Christians embarked on a summer-long evangelical outreach known as the Blitz to several university campuses in the southwestern United States. And uh, they would have two- to three-day events using singing, track distribution, and sidewalk canvassing to draw crowds and spread the word. And as the movement expanded, additional mission outreaches and training conferences took place. And in the 1970s and the late 1970s, they started getting written up in newspapers, uh, articles, former members, watch, you know, cult watchdogs like myself, uh, they started writing and criticizing about this group and that continued into the 80s and 90s. And so then you got Great Commission International in, in 1983 that was formed uh, by McCotter and Clark. And um, so then 
you got ex leaders in the 80s who staged conferences to help other ex members to recover from the emotional and psychological damage they experienced in the Great Commission churches. And some of these former leaders went on to form the world's first and only accredited cult recovery center known as the Wellspring Retreat. So you can look that up as well. And that was connected with former members of this group. And so in 1986, Jim McCotter announced his resignation from the GCI, stating a desire to utilize his entrepreneurial abilities in an attempt to influence, influence secular media for Christ. And two years later, McCotter moved to Florida, and he has not since attended a church affiliated with the movement. But rumor has it that uh, his name has come up and his presence has been known under a different uh, movement. Um, and you can kind of look him up on the internet. Uh, Jim McCotter is his name again. So in 1989, Great Commission International changed its name to the Great Commission Association of Churches and is known today as the Great Commission Churches. Also in 1989, Great Commission Ministries, under the initial leadership of Dave Bovenmeyer, was formed. Its aim was to mobilize people into campus ministry by training them to raise financial support and equipping them for campus ministry. So kind of like Campus Crusade for Christ, um, things of that nature. And so in, in 1991, there was an errors and weaknesses paper that the group came out with. They admitted to a lot of different abuses uh, regarding, and they became a member of National Association of Evangelicals, the NAE, and Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, which they subsequently um, have broken off with the NAE, which is interesting. Okay, uh, so self-admitted abuses, uh, they admitted to a prideful attitude. They kind of talked as if they were the only church, the only true church. Improper response to criticism, an elitist attitude, misapplication or misinterpretation of scripture. So scripture twisting in, in there. Failing to distinguish between a command principle or preference, authoritarian or insensitive leadership, lack of emphasis on formal education. Uh, basically, they diss college and going to college. And, you know, it's kind of funny. You have a college ministry that this is going to college, right? Uh, and a belief that every man should be an elder, okay? So all of those are abuses they've admitted to, but a lot of the former members that are coming out even today are saying, hey, this stuff's still going on. And so you got criticism and abuses. Uh, they've been written up in different books about uh, cults and um, listed as a cult, which I'm very openly saying they definitely fit the criteria for a cult, not so much in their theological beliefs as much as in their practices, very heavy discipleship and abusive uh, mind control practices uh, that are kind of more so signs of a cult from my perspective than any of the other stuff um, that you might put out there. And so lots of stuff about behavior control from these former members. I'm just going to give you an example. People have tailored their lives around this church. They have chosen careers that will allow them to move with the church. They refuse to move to a town that doesn't have a GCM church. They choose a wife or a husband based on that individual's commitment to the GCM. We are told at our fall retreat that if you are not totally committed to your local church, you lack courage, and that every time you change church families, you are damaging a part of your soul forever. The difference between GCM and the church referred to in the New Testament has become blurred in many areas. Great Commission Ministries is only a very small piece of the church, but the mindset seems to be that GCM is the way. It is the church. GCM has the answers, has the best way to do things, and other churches are seen as subpar. Other churches will not get you as close to God as GCM church will. Whenever such attitudes cropped up. The first thing I felt was fear. Should I feel this too? Should I not? Proverbs 3.34 scared me a lot. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I used to struggle a lot with this in my conversations with God. Was this real pride I was encountering? If so, what was I supposed to do? Was this really an army I could fight in or would even want to fight in? So that's one thing on behavior control, information control. A version of George Orwell's double think is applied to everything. Any reading material critical of GCI was satanic. Anyone who criticized the elders was manipulated by the devil. We were instructed to go about capturing naughty thoughts by consigning all critical ideas to the demonic. 
I found myself in constant war with myself. The Satan I jumped at tried to jump over with my own shadow. Any kind of search for counsel would bring bibliolatry into play. So anytime you <laughs> seek counsel outside the group, then you're committing bibliolatry, right? Whenever anything challenged the GCI worldview, we were taught to answer with scripture in our heads or better allowed. Going on to thought control, okay? A common theme in interviews we conduct is that GCM strongly discourages any outside Christian counseling, even on issues that has nobody trained to handle. Quite often what happens when somebody finally does get outside counseling, the counselor recommends they find another church. This may explain their reluctance, okay? Emotion control. If, uh, capping off the bite model, mind control, right? If you ask counsel, you were expected to follow it or else you were considered disobedient to God. If, it, if someone higher up counsel you to do something, they were your spiritual authority and thus God in his sovereignty has placed them above you. And so you were thought to be disobeying God if you disobeyed them. The verse used quite often to back this theology up was, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they watch on behalf of your souls. Nobody was trusted to be able to hear from God on their own, and thus people's lives were basically lived in complete submission to what their spiritual leader decided was best for them. It wasn't always a bad thing, as some people needed guidance. But however, it pretty much discouraged you from developing any sort of functional relationship with God and was very legalistic and controlling due to the way it was presented as God's will and not a pastor's advice. So that's the Great Commission Churches in a nutshell. I hope you got something out of this. And uh, write down in your comments below, what do you think about this? Do you know somebody who is in the Great Commission Churches? Uh, were you in it yourself? Or were you in a similar church that you see kind of parallels there? Uh, do you understand why I would put them in the category of a cult? Or do you disagree? And so I would love to hear your thoughts on all those things down below. And I just want to encourage you, if you haven't already, please like, subscribe, and share this video with others and this channel with others. It helps every time you do that. It actually helps the channel out financially, and it helps us to grow and get in front of others. Um, if you want to connect with us, we invite you to join the conversation, facebook.com slash people of the free gift. And until next time, this is Jason from People of the Free Gift, signing off.